Good afternoon, sir. Howdy, howdy, howdy. What's happening today? We're all going to wave at Kate. Bye, Kate. There she goes. We've been wanting to do one for ages. Who's Reg? Yeah. She's trying to hide Reg. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's get through the intro. We've been asked to do this one loads and loads and loads, and we finally got a really nice one to do it on. So let's do a buyer's guide on a Lamborghini Huracan. Morning, Hello, afternoon, afternoon, whatever time it is now. Bonjour. Uh, so we've been asked loads and loads and loads to do this one and we've just either not had the time or not had the car. So this is Paul's really, really lovely uh, Lamborghini Huracan LP610-4 uh, in Titan Grigio Mate. Looks lovely. Which is Titan Matte. No, Titan Grey. No, Matt Gray. I don't know. We get there in the end. Yeah, yeah. He's got a lovely sort of bronze gold perf wheels and he's got like a Vorsteiner rear wing as well. The perf wheels. Um, and so it is very, very pretty. Vorsteiner wing. Little side skirts on it. Uh, it's got a Krapovich exhaust. Uh, it is dirty, but at the end of the day, it's in for service and a repair. So, um, and because it's matte paint, Jordan, well, I wouldn't wash these. I'd just let Jordan do it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because you cannot polish matte paint. So if you scratch it or buff it or mar it or anything, you is up, oh, up El Padlo without, no. El Creek. Up El Creekio without a paddle. That's yep. about right, isn't it? So, said it again. This is, I'm going to piss a lot of people off now. Gen 2 R8 on a Huracan at the same platform just like an LP Gallardo and a Gen 1 R8. They're the same platform. The difference is anything you see and touch, basically. Um, but when you, if I was to take all the body panels off and park it next to an R8, you'd be like, oh, look, it's an R8, right? That's not to devalue what it is, because at the end of the day, it's a Lamborghini. It's just to say that they share chassis, electronics, engine, drivetrain, and running gear, right? Let the lorry pass. Let's wait for the lorry. So it's a 5.2 V10. It's twin cam per head. Variable valve timing on inlet and exhaust. It's got 20 injectors, so 10 lowers, 10 uppers. Uh, same as a Gen 2 R8. Um, so this works in stratified and homogenous fueling. It does help with the carbon buildup. Uh, it has got a DL800 seven speed transmission and again there's differences between a 610 and a 580 same as in the plus and non plus in the r8 so there are differences in the gearbox um, but it's the same framework it's got four wheel drive the 580 obviously does not it's a rear wheel drive or an rws as in the r8 so it's a four wheel drive it has what's known as a haldex front coupling so where is the old one in the gallardo and the gem one r8 was a viscous coupling. It always transferred uh, up to 120 newton meters of torque. This is now a Haldex coupling, so the same as a Golf R or an S3 or TTRS, where it's clutched. So this car can feel very rear wheel drive. And when it then starts to get a difference of slip value across the axles, it'll engage the front drive. It'll engage the front. So it can only ever be up to 50%. It cannot be a front wheel drive car, but it can be a rear wheel drive car. We sell Cyvex Haldex controllers that are completely programmable to allow us to have it in just rear wheel drive mode. And then we can just trim and tune how the Haldex behaves. And we do that a lot on the twin turbo stuff, especially where we want to use burnout mode or where we're trying to launch it. So a Haldex controller can help affect the balance of the car and it has a huge effect on the balance, especially when you drive on track as well, what them front wheels are doing. Um, there's no adjustment in camber, front or rear, so you have to shim it. So we sell shim kits for these, um, but there's no eccentric bolts like in the Guard or the Gen 1. It is purely done on shims, and that's how you set the camber. The Huracan has nose lift as an option. Not all of them do, but the R8 does not have nose lift. 
So this has nose lift functionality and it sits up in the front under the scuttle. Uh, what else? What else? What else? What else? Problems we see, right? Problems we see. Nose lift control module. Can you film you with the car behind you. There we go. Problems we see. Nose lift control module. It lives in the world's stupidest place. It lives down the side, basically. If you were to lift the frunk out, right? It lives under here, under the frame rail. So what happens is the water drains down through the drain holes, sits on the frame rails, runs over the frame rail and into the, into the nose lift module and fills the nose lift module full of water, right? Um, so we've done just, in, we do loads, we do, we do loads. We've changed loads of nose lift modules. So what we do when we change the nose lift module is we put waterproof tape over the top of the join of the control unit because it's sat upright, so connectors go on the bottom and it leaks in through the join of the plastic case. So we seal that up with waterproof tape and then what we do is on the frame rail, we essentially put a bead of sealant, like a bridge or like a dam, down the frame rail and out. So the water, when it sits on a frame rail, can't run into the, the framework of the luggage carrier. It has to run a different way. So we do that. Um, and is, it's, that, is that not a recall or anything on these? That was just, I, I, th uh, I think you get it done under warranty, but yeah. I don't think it was so much of a, like a workshop action. So, or I haven't seen it. Lambic, did, someone works inside a network and can tell me different, then let us know. But obviously yeah. we're not, we would not just fix it if it came in, if it was a car under warranty, I'd be telling the owner on the phone to us because we can't do manufacturer warranty. I'd be saying, take it back to the dealer, but we do, we do enough of them. Uh, other than that, the front end, uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty bulletproof. Like I said, the nose lift module, if you've got it, lives under here. And then battery compartment there. So you can see, look, Paul's got a C-Tech in. So that's fine. All right, so that's what, Run of the mill toolkit. You obviously get your tire sealant. Uh, you've got your tow and eye, and you've got your emergency release. Make sure you have this in your toolkit, Gen One or Gen Two, because if you do not, and your car breaks down, it is stuck. So that sits in a special place behind the basically where your elbow would go. You hook it on, you lift it all the way over, and it lifts parking lock up. So you're because, not stranded then when you've got your flat battery or yep, whatever it might be. Because yeah. parking lock is hydraulic. So if your car's fallen with park, if your car's stopped with parking lock on, you oh. is in trouble. So make sure you have that in that toolkit. And then this side then. Oh, he's got a few bits and pieces, but you get your pump and your few other stuff as well. So your two your two toolkits sit like this. Some of this is Paul's personal effects, so. Good enough. Your buttons. You obviously got release button down here in a footwell. Okay, let me just whether you can get on it. Just the uh, right there we go. Got so them. yep, that's for front trunk release, and yeah. then obviously engine bay release. You need to have the ignition on. Okay. Um, but that's engine lid release, and while you're in there, so ignition on, and then just press your pops a rear. There we go. All right. We've got the service cover off because of course we've serviced it. But you'll essentially have uh, a, a, a trim that sits over here that covers all that area. So you can see there, look, you've got your coolant tank up in the top right. Two fuse boxes in these, two air boxes, obviously your exhaust, and then your, he's got the forged carbon trim, so he's got real nice trims on it. Um, but sometimes they're in plastic. And the center trim sort of comes up here. So there's your oil tank. On a Lamborghini, it has a conventional dipstick. And on the R8, it's electronic. It doesn't have a dipstick. So this is more like a facelift Gen 1 R8 than it is a Gen 2 in that respect. No idea why. Can't tell you. Who knows? Gen 2 has a, a, is all done the dash. Hurricane, it's all done the dipstick. Probably prefer on a dipstick, to be fair. It's much easier to control. Um, this one's had aftermarket exhaust put on it, so it's got a Krapovich exhaust. Which you can see through at holes. And it's got carbon tips as well. Very nice. Uh, 
On this kind of model, you don't really get it so much, but they're five stud wheel, but obviously on the Perf, you can get center locks. We've done quite a few conversions for people where we've put the center lock hubs on. Um, so you can convert them. You, run, you can run Perf wheel or a center lock, an aftermarket, aftermarket center lock wheel, and you change the hubs to run a center lock disc, basically, or a center lock hub rather than a five bolt hub. Okay. Um, they look cool center locks, don't they? Yeah, center locks rock. Yeah. Until you've got to undo them or do them up or, you know, take them to get tires changed. Uh, the jacking positions are the same as an R8. Uh, so there's an indent on the floor here. You, you won't be able to see it. But there's a circle indent on the floor that you put your jack on there. Or at the front, it's literally on the frame or on the floor inside the welded inside the seam where the where the skirt joins just behind the front wheel and that's where we jack them up from um if you've got a good quality trolley jack at home i would say do that just go on the jacking points to be fair the chassis are that stiff that you can jack the back up and it'll jack the front up at the same time as well okay um the other thing to watch out for is whether it's got the uprated or the modified floor panel that you jack up on in this corner. So the earlier ones, this was the same one of Gen 2 R8s as well, the tire pressure control module clipped in with one screw. So it clipped in on a plastic hook onto the floor, and then there was a screw holding this panel in, and screwed to the panel was a tire pressure control module. And you'd go along a big bump, and the clip would break, and the tire pressure control module would fall and drag on its loom down the road behind you. Oh dear. Which is what happened to this one and it had been repaired twice, well, once or twice already. So there's actually a modified floor panel. It's about 50 quid, and you pay 15 quid for the cover, and then there's three screws to screw the cover to the floor panel, and then there's two screws to screw the tire pressure module to that. So if you've got a fully working tire pressure module, and you look underneath and the black cover's just got one screw, save yourself a load of money and a load of hassle, spend 75 quid, get the uprated floor panel, and swap it before your tire pressure module falls out. So this one had fallen out and it had worn the loom straight through and worn the plug. And it bloody happens to these NR8s and it's a nightmare. So this one, we had to build a new loom, buy a new module. Uh, so the repair wise are like 10 quid each and there's 10 of them. The connector housing was another 20 quid. The control module, oof, we didn't buy a Lambo one which is 690 quid. Oof. The same part number from Audi is 240. So we bought an Audi control module, saved him 300 odd quid, right? And then we've obviously, Sandy Fruity? Huh, MR2. Um, and then obviously spent some time because building the new loom. The problem is all four signal wires from each wheel are blue and white. So it's not like one's blue and white, it's not like one's orange and white. So you've got to sit there, we have to take all four, well, three arch liners out, because the fourth one is the one that's left. We have to take all three arch liners out, get to the three receivers and do a continuity test between the receiver and the wiring to work out which was rear left, which was rear right, which was right front. So we've had to do that. Um, and it's all working now. I've just got to go through the test plan on the computer again to reset it and jobs are good on, but it's come back to life. So make sure you do that if you have got the old style tire pressure cover. Other than that, oil every year, oil and filter every year, every 12 months or 10,000 miles, whatever comes first. Pollen filter and brake fluid every two years, plus your oil. Then every four years, it's those three things, plus transmission fluid, front diff fluid, Haldex fluid, and make sure the people doing Haldex fluid reset the Haldex motor. Uh, did I say gearbox oil? gearbox oil, uh, spark plugs and air filters. There is a fuel filter, but it's in the tank. It's not external like the, uh, like the Gallardo or the Gem ones. Um, so they're not really a serviceable item because you have to buy a whole new pump assembly. So unless we had suspicions of it being a problem, we wouldn't recommend, we wouldn't do that as part of the service item. Other than that, mate, they're hard as nails. Hard as bloody nails, they well, That's good to hear. Yeah, I like them. I like them too. Now, would you have a Gen 2 or one of these? That is a hard question. But before we get onto that, the two things that crop up when we do inspections are mileage blockers. Very, very, very common and easy to do on these and Gen 2 R8s, right? Every car that's ever been leased in the history of the world has probably had a mileage blocker on it. We see so many cars come in for inspections and they've, the mileage doesn't add up. 
Now, I'm not going to give away the keys to City, but there's a way to tell. And if you switched on, you'll figure it out. But basically, mileage and different modules don't add up. They're not the same. The other thing is launches. They get launched, and there is a launch count inside the transmission. Now, I've always said to people, really, I wouldn't be too freaked out if it has one launch a month for its life. Does that make sense? Yeah, that so makes if it's sense. like 30 months old, you know, and it's done 30 launches, I wouldn't start to I wouldn't start to worry. But we've had cars in that are maxed out on it's either 199 or 299. And then like can't count any more launches. So just if you're going to check one or you're going to buy one, just get the mileage check and uh, do a launch check or, or uh, check the launch counter inside the transmission. Um, because they're easy. Well, launch just shows the the abuse it's had really, but a mileage blocker it honestly is so easy. You get OBD mileage blockers, and it literally just corrupts the canvas to stop it signaling back and forth. The only thing I don't like on these as well, and the Gen 2s, because it screws up loads of stuff, is ghosts and mobilizers, okay. where you've got to jump in and press buttons. Because ultimately, how the ghost works is, is that again, it crashes the CAN bus. So it's not tied into um, like, a, like a tracker, like a deadbolt tracker. It doesn't tie into like a fuel, a fuel pump relay or you know the engine control unit relay or anything like that. It doesn't isolate a system completely. All it does is it just crashes a network. So if you try to start the car before you've, before you've basically turned the ghost off, every time you turn it on, you'll have loads and loads of fault memories. And these are super critical on, uh, on data bus. So when we erase a fault memory, you can go back in 50 times afterwards and it's still there. You've got to let the car go to sleep completely and on a hurricane it's the red handbrake light if you turn the ignition off lock it handbrake light will stay on 20 minutes later it'll go off and that's how you do a, a system reset on a hurricane it's not 20 minutes i'm just being dramatic um, but these ghosts you literally put it gra live ground canvas wires and then it sits there and it wants you to press up paddle and window switch and all that nonsense uh, but it isolates a car by crashing a network okay um so you need to not make I, I don't like them just go and buy a deadbolt so i don't like them so r8 or hurricane i don't know i don't know i've had a gen 2 r8 i loved it did everything i wanted it to i look at that now and i think that's amazing if i hadn't have had my gen 2 and i had the opportunity to buy a hurricane i would have one but now I've had, now I've had that platform. Would I, I don't? I think I would go and have something else first. It's not a say on anything to do with the car because I think they are mega. The only thing that might is a Perth. Yeah, I get that. But if I was spending two hundred grand on a car, I would still think six seven five LT over a Perth. Back to the Macca. Yeah. So, I don't know. If I hadn't have had... Where well, the prices are and these are now, bloody hell, they're cheap. If I hadn't have had a Gen 2 R8, I probably would have had a lamp, would have got one of these. But because I've had one, I don't know. So what are the comparative prices like now with these? Because they're they always quite a big gap. 50 them, grand, being realistic. Okay. It's 50 grand. Yeah. So if you were getting into a Gen 2 R8 now for 70, 80. 70, 80, you're paying 120, 130. They're like 600 LT prices. Yeah. Um, you, so anything you see or touch is just, you have to go to Lambo to buy. So service prices, same as an R8, that's fine. Discs, pads, same as an R8, that's fine. Tire pressure module, same as an R8. When you start getting into anything you see and touch, you're dictated to by Lamborghini on what you're going to pay. Same as a Gallardo, exactly the same. Um, so that's the only thing you've got to watch. Um, then I would say buying and selling one of these is probably a little bit more, um, not dependent on, but the, the history of it there and where you've taken it is more critical than say on an R8. An R8 you might look at, they get sort of bounded in with Audi specialists and people go, oh, they're a good specialist, they'll be fine. 
Lamborghinis, I think owners might be a little bit more, they would buy from Pangborn, Craig at Pangborn. Sure. Do you know what I mean? We deal with them quite a lot. And, you know, in the same way that if I was probably going to go and buy a McLaren or if I was going to buy a Perth, I would do it through network. So I think you get that a lot more. So what about the driving experience? You've obviously driven both. Yeah, this How is, is this, this is Rora. Yeah. Yeah. Gen 2 R8 is a little bit more comfortable. Um, everything's a little bit more compliant. This is Rora. Uh, it's a little bit more in your face, especially when you put it in, I always forget the modes, Strada, Corsa. Is a um, lot of that purely down to the electronics? Um, no, I same. would say running gear. Okay. So it, the suspension feel is different. Um, I would say the seats, they transmit a lot more of the feel through it for you. Um, the steering and the brakes don't really feel any different. The power of the engine doesn't really feel any different. The noise out of it does. The exhaust systems are different, uh, even as standard. So you get a little bit more bite through it. Um, it's, it is lower. It does feel a little bit more uh, planted is not the right word. It transmits more to you as a driver. An R8 is um, not numb because what you can do with an R8 is fucking impressive. Uh, but it's just uh, probably flatters you a little bit more than what this would. And then the Ferrari is another level. You go and jump in a 458 and you try and treat a Ferrari how you would treat this one R8 and it'll turn you around. Same as a McLaren. So you, I would say that the, how you go up, you, they're getting rawer. So you've got to be, you know, they can flatter you as a driver. And this can, this has got some nice net around it to protect you until you go down into bottom mode on a steering wheel and send it. And then it, then it's like that, mate, you're on your own. Then it can bite you. Yeah, 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 yeah. But what a striking car. They look you know awesome. What I mean? they yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Lambos always look awesome. I do, I do love them. They do look good. Um, you just said a minute ago, tuning wise, to be fair, if it's a 610, I wouldn't bother. I wouldn't do anything to it. Your bang for buck isn't there. Um, a perf and one of these are not far apart on a dyno. People say they can put perf tunes on them. We have done it. I, I, I don't, I think you can spend your money on better things. Uh, good exhaust, if you like being Larry, is good. Um, the Akrapovic is quite subtle. If you start getting into, say, a Quicksilver, then you're waking the neighbours up. They're pretty, they're pretty mental. Um, especially when you've got them open, they sound proper Formula One-esque. Um, and just look after it, just service it, service it really. Don't really have too many problems. We don't see major issues. We see the same sort of little things. We see height lift modules, see tire pressure monitoring modules. Um, but other than that, we don't, we don't, same as the Gen 2s really, don't really see them for broken stuff. Um, that's about it. Job done. Job's job, mate. So, I think I've covered just about everything. If I've missed anything, let us know. Um, but I like them. I like them. I like them, just wouldn't spend my money on one. <laughs> Bit ash. No, no, they are good, they are good cars. They are good cars. It's, um, they're just, from my point of view, they're very close to an R8 and I've had an R8. Um, if I hadn't have had an R8, I've got friends with Hurricanes who love them. They've got Perfs, they've got Technicas. Um, you could daily that. Genuinely, you could daily that and it'd be fine. Just got to look after it. Work on a thousand pound a niggle, service it like you should. And then, yeah, when the time is right, go to Mexico and drive it like you stole it. <laughs> Smash buttons, tell us what we did wrong. And we will see you on the next one.